Okay, perfect. Okay, um, thank you everyone for taking the time to join us today. We appreciate your presence and we hope that you will enjoy this conversation. SP would like to first thank the Canadian Association of Physicists, MGAPS and Higher PhD for supporting this event. Uh, oh, I'm told that this hasn't started the live stream at the moment. Okay, um, we can edit this in afterwards. Um, all right, so first, as we begin, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the lands on which we gather today. Science and Policy Exchange is based in Chiotiaki, Montreal, the traditional and unceded territory of the commune Cahaga, a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst many First Nations, including the commune Cahaga of the Huduna, Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wandat, the Abenaki, and the Anishinaabe. We further acknowledge the deep ties between colonialism and modern Western science and research, especially in Chiotiaki, where it hosts to a large number of research ecosystems. We encourage our participants to challenge their own ties to systems of oppressions that have marginalized Indigenous communities. At SB, we strive to support Indigenous students and researchers by actively reaching out to and working with Indigenous STEM community to collaboratively advocate for their inclusion in evidence-informed decision-making. Here are additional resources that we encourage our participants to consult. And although I'm just flashing you this card, uh, the reason is that um, if this event will be recorded and therefore you can go back and pause the video to read the resources afterwards. Um, this event, may or may not be live streaming right now. Um, this is something we can verify afterwards. And if you're attending the panel and live tweeting, don't forget to tag us at, uh, at DSP underscore SP and use the hashtag um, SP career paths and science policy career paths. We also encourage questions for the Q&A period at the end. So a little bit about myself, I'm co-president my name is Anne Corey Trin. I'm co-president of Science and Policy Exchange, and I'm also a PhD candidate at McGill University. SP provides an open and accessible platform for the next generation of scientists and researchers to exchange ideas and perspectives, develop their networks and skills, and explore new solutions to emerging and persisting issues at the interface of science, policy, and society. SP is based in Montreal, but we have and welcome members from across the country. So what that means in practice is that we aim to support and build cap capacity for tomorrow's leaders in science policy by providing resources, training, and opportunities for individuals to expand their networks. We produce and disseminate resources for and from the next generation of scientists and researchers through panel discussions, roundtable discussions, and reports. And we engage stakeholders and rights holders in science policy and society to amplify and promote the inclusion of next generation voices through consultations, reports, and campaigns. If you would like to be involved, please email us and or follow us on our social media platforms. Since this is a career panel, we'd like to highlight some other upcoming events that may further help demystify science policy. Science policy is, SP is partnering with higher PhDs for this upcoming webinar by Katie Sedevi Haley from the Council of Canadian Academies. Our PhD is a registered nonprofit organizing that organization that helps talents with advanced degrees navigate career paths outside of academia and employers optimize the value of their talents with advanced degrees. For those who don't know, the CC produces a number of reports directly affecting the experiences of researchers and science development in Canada through reports such as these. If you'd like to learn more about researching policies at the CCA, don't miss this free webinar on July 14. As mentioned previously, SV also provides a number of training opportunities. In this area, SV is offering a science diplomacy workshop about resource scarcity due to the effects of climate change and the melting of the Arctic ice caps. What better time to offer this than in the middle of July? You can find additional information about our social media on our social media pages. So now to talk. Since this event was designed for with physicists in mind, I'd like to frame the conversation that you'll hear by speaking about my own experience. 
So I'm, like I mentioned, I'm a PhD graduate student at McGill University. I'm a high end energy theorist working on topics that you wouldn't normally associate with science policy. Um, no one's going to be regulating string theory anytime soon. But like many of you, I hope I have a life outside of my lab and some of it includes a TA ship. Um, I also had the opportunity to help redesign uh, lab curriculums and I also engaged in science communication. All of these experiences underscored the value and the importance of accessibility in science. So given that ex my experience, I have come to recognize the value of science in, of accessibility in science and therefore my main motivation in science policy is to develop better policies for science. This includes many aspects such as funding, EDI, trainee support, and improving the research infrastructure. But this isn't the only possible path. Today, you'll hear about many ex people working at the interface of science and policy, many coming, people coming from industry, government, nonprofit, and academia. And you will also hear about their own experiences in research coming from a wide range of physics backgrounds. So I'm just going to end with a few resources that you might want to learn more, where you can learn more about science policy. Here are a number of um, ECR and student-led science policy organizations. Um, although the Vancouver-based organization doesn't have a name yet, you can reach out to us to learn more. Um, there are a number of advisory groups that use us that consult the next generation of researchers in science advice. And there are, these are other organizations and resources that might help people better understand science policy. Of course, for us physicists, the Canadian Association of Physicists also provides some opportunities. For those who don't know, CAP has a science policy committee which aims to drive and assess the CAP's efforts surrounding advocating for physicists and for scientists generally with decision makers and funders. You can contact their committee chairs to learn more on how to be engaged. Now, with that all out of the way, I think you've heard enough of my jibber jabber. So I'd like to introduce our moderator today, Lisa, who is MGAPS's VP of Professional Development to moderate this panel. Hope you enjoyed the conversation. So hi everyone, my name is Lisa. Um, I'm a PhD candidate in physics at McGill University and lately a little bit like Anne Coy, I've spent a lot of time thinking about whether or not I wanted to pursue uh, a career in academia. And as I was talking to former um, physics students or alumni, uh, I realized that there is a vast range of careers that physicists take on uh, after their, their, uh, their time as a, as a physicist. Um, so without further ado, today uh, I wanted to organize kind of like a panel series where uh, for MGAPS where we talk to uh, people from different sectors and today just happened to be a science policy, uh, which I'm really excited about and very curious, curious about. So without further ado, I will briefly introduce uh, our four panelists um, and then I'll leave the floor uh, to them to and so some of the questions that I've collected over the past couple of weeks from uh, students in the department and, and myself. Um, and then later on at the, at the last part of this panel, I'll open the floor for anyone. So if anyone during our discussion have any question, feel free to uh, put them in the chat. Uh, I can either ask them at the end or uh, you can wait until the end to, to ask them yourself. So without further ado, uh, the first panelist we have is uh, Amy Gunther. So Dr. Dr. Amy Gunther is a scientific advisor for quantum within the science policy integration directorate at the Defense Research and Development Canada. Amy is, has also over a decade of ex experience commu communicating at, at quantum and optical science, whether it be to kids, family, or policymaker. Uh, Amy has a PhD in quantum information uh, in, in experimental quantum optics uh, from the Institute for Quantum Computing at University of Waterloo. And then secondly, we have Amita Kutner. Uh, Kutner? Dr. Amita Kutner is uh, the co-founder of uh, the Moonlight Institute, a nonprofit organization that seeks to create frameworks for an equitable and just future, um, taking into account the realities of the climate emergency as well as technology and decolonization. Amita holds a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Their research focused on black holes, wormholes, quantum effects, uh, and the early universe. Amita has also served as critic 
uh, for Science and Innovation for the Green Party of Canada and also ran for a party leadership in 2020 on a platform of justice, science, and resilience. Next, we have uh, Sophie McGibbon. Sophie is a biophysics PhD candidate at the University of Toronto. Her research is focused on uh, physics uh, that helps to understand uh, population dynamics in cell systems, such as cancer growth. Uh, she has held several elected positions in strong uh, policy implementation mandates at the University of Toronto, such as the Council on Student Services. Um, she's also served as the uh, Internal Affairs Director of the Toronto Science Policy Network and looks forward to continuing uh, to explore the intersections of science and policy after graduation. And finally, uh, we have Madison Reiling, uh, an alumni from uh, McGill University. So following a joint honors uh, math and physics degree at McGill University, Dr. Madison Reiling completed a master's in medical physics at the University at Université Laval uh, after fast tracking to a PhD uh, in physics. Her research focused on developing image based tools for cancer radio uh, therapy treatments. And in parallel to her research, uh, Madison was a student advisor for uh, the Quebec's chief scientist for nearly four years and was the sole student member uh, of the FRQNT, the Fonds de Recherche uh, du Québec en Nature et Technologie. Madison is now a member of Canada's Chief Science Advisors Inaugural Youth Council, as well as a member of the student-led nonprofit organization Science, Science and Policy Exchange. Now, Madison is currently working as a project manager for Uptonic, uh, Quebec's industrial photonic clusters. So this was a very long introduction, but I'm very happy I got all of this out uh, so that hopefully we can talk about the exciting things that you've done, both while you were a graduate student and afterwards up until where we are now. So how about, um, I think I'd like to leave this floor for the panelists um, and have a uh, give you the opportunity to tell us what your journey is like, uh, where you're coming from, and how you got to where you are now. Uh, starting with uh, Amy. Uh, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are in the country. Um, I, I'm currently uh, on the unceded territory of, um, coming today from the unceded territory of the Algonquin Apishinaabe uh, people uh, in Ottawa, Ontario. And I've been slowly migrating across the country following physics, and that is not a lie. Um, from the best coast, west coast, uh, I migrated to, uh, B to Alberta and did my undergrad at the University of Calgary. That was my first taste of physics there. Uh, I did a honors, honors physics and uh, got my first taste of quantum and my undergrad undergraduate research there. Uh, so uh, my one goal at that point was to try and get to grad school. Not pretty that was my, I didn't even consider any other options at that point. Uh, and I, I got into the University of Waterloo at the, in a master's in uh, quantum optics because, you know, lasers plus quantum like that, that sounds so cool and so smart. I want to be smart. So like that, I'm not saying this is the best approach to pick what field you're going to go into, but this was a, definitely a factor of, of my own. Uh, so I, 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 at Waterloo there, I, as was mentioned in my bio bit, I started doing some, started broadening my horizons a bit after being just a bookworm for four years and uh, started some science communication and, and, and some other things along the way. By the end of my master's, I knew like get, being fully immersed in academia that, you know, by reading, reading some of the statistics out there, that there, there really was no chance that I would actually make it uh, like reasonably uh, in academia to, to have stability that I, that I sought uh, in a career. Uh, so, uh, but I, I only realized that at the very end of my, my master's, I'm like, well, I still don't know how to get a job or do apply my skills. So I really did love what, what my research. So I, I decided to stay for a PhD, but on my own personal uh, uh, condition that I needed to walk out with a job and a new career direction, you know, to figure out how to pivot out. So I spent my, I spent uh, I don't know, four or five years in my PhD there trying to explore the different areas there. Uh, at one of the sponsors of today's panel is the Canadian Association of Physicists. That was my first taste in science policy because at their, their annual Congress, uh, there was a free breakfast for the science policy committee. Uh, so I'm just, uh, so that was my, you know, what, what do they do? What is this about? 
Uh, so that's where I started volunteering there. I wrote a few things and starting to uh, care about who funds what in Canada and how, how does science get funded? How does research happen? And looking at the budgets every year. So that was my first taste uh, of that. And what I enjoyed about that was, uh, you know, I, I one of my the driving forces, I, I want to, uh, to build with my hands. So it's the quantum optics work quite well with that. But I also want to make things better. Uh, so I saw some aspects of can we make, you know, so similar to what Anne Cohen mentioned, the policy for science. I had a lot of those similar motivations as well. Can, you know, using science communication, except maybe not to children and families, maybe try to maybe pitching it more to the other folks. Uh, maybe I could start moving in that direction. So that my tax science policy fellowship was my uh, something I saw the very first year it was announced and was like, I'm going to apply for that. So it really was just like I was waiting for that until when I finally got finished my, my PhD and I applied for that. And my, my posting was at uh, Defense Research and Development Canada. So that was my, my journey from uh, physics to government in a nutshell. Thank you, Amy. This sounds, a lot of it resonated with me and I'm sure with a lot of the people who are here. Um, free I have food part? Of, sorry? The free food part? Yeah, the free food part, <laughs> especially that. <laughs> um, yeah, but also uh, the MyTax uh, Science Policy Fellowship, which I definitely saw in my inbox and, and was curious about. So I might ask you about this later. Uh, how about we move on to Anita? Thank you. Yes, well, I am on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people, and I will add that it is my personal commitment to work on having these lands returned. Um, I grew up in the Vancouver, North Vancouver area, and I ended up um, going to boarding school in California, and that's how I ended up starting kind of there at the end of my high school time. Um, and while I was there, actually, my home in North Vancouver was destroyed by a mudslide. So that kind of changed my pathway of where I kind of felt was home. And so I kind of stayed in, in California for longer, though I came back to the University of British Columbia for the beginning of my undergrad, which still found it hard to be here. So went back to California, studied what I absolutely had loved since I was a child, which was cosmology. And I ended up, my dissertation ended up being on black holes and wormholes. And I stayed at the University of California, Santa Cruz through that time because of my advisor, because we got along so well. And so I, I believe as many graduate students do, as you get somewhere in your graduate degree, you decide whether you're interested in academia or not, and what's actually motivating you in your life. And I realized I had no interest in the stress of academia, in, in, in the stress or as I should say of academia and as much as I love my research I really wanted to have impact and it's a time at a certain election in the U.S. where there was a lot happening and it was clear that you know there's there's a lot of suffering around the planet and a lot of crises and emergencies so I said oh, I want to do something impactful so I kind of with my advisor made a list of the things to do that would be the highest impact and so I went straight for actually attempting to get elected because I think, you know, if you can get in, this is how you, this is how you can change policy. And we talked a lot about existential threat and artificial intelligence and other things as he founded organizations around that. Um, and of course, so I came home, I ran, I actually ran while I was writing my dissertation, which is a little more than I suggest anyone else do. <laughs> but it was a learning experience. And of course, I didn't win, but I got to be shadow cabinet for the Green Party, which meant I got to actually influence the platform, which got discussed nationally, which was good. And kind of actually, the intention for me was to have an impact there, not particularly get elected, but I then ran for leadership just to do the same thing. Like we really need to center science and evidence um, at, at, along with justice, which I think you know, I really appreciate in the land acknowledgement talking about you know, the Western science and the, the negative impacts there and the kind of history of racism is really important. Um, for moving forward. But through that whole thing, and actually before leadership, I came to a place realizing that there's a lot of stuff missing in terms of policy, and less policy for science, but using science to create policy. There's, there's a gap in translating research into policy, and there's a lot of amazing policy research being done, and especially around technology, artificial intelligence, ethical use of technology, there's not much. And that along with kind of the need for um, tools and community project support, I decided with a friend to found a nonprofit 
to, to actually create some of the frameworks and do some of the hard work in between the actual research and getting stuff implemented to actually just help people and communities actualize, actualize work that needs to be done. So here I am. Thank you, Amita. Uh, I think, again, I think I, I relate to a lot of things such as wanting to do something impactful um, and also <laughs> realizing that the research that I currently do isn't as impactful that I, I wish it was. Um, but I'm, I'm very curious and I'm glad to hear that you were also having a discussion with your advisor while you were trying to, to pivot uh, in your career. Um, so I'd like to touch on that a little bit more later. But without further ado, um, do you want to go ahead, Sophie? Sure, yeah. Um, my name's Sophie. I'm currently uh, in Toronto, which is the traditional territory of, of many nations, um, including the Mississaugas of the Credit River, the Ashinabek, the Chippewa, and the uh, Haudenosaunee, um, and the Wendat peoples. Uh, and it's covered by the Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, I'm here doing my PhD uh, in physics at the University of Toronto. And what led me here was not actually physics, kind of. I, I really wanted to do a degree in biology because cell processes fascinated me. And then I quickly realized that I would have had to do a bunch of courses on like how your skeleton works and didn't want to do that. And so I took physics instead. And, uh, and now in my PhD, have pivoted back to looking at what cells do. So I just kind of uh, skipped the middle bit. Um, and one of the courses that I took in my PhD was um, through some of the amazing hospitals that happen around here on regenerative medicine. And one of the people who came to talk to us was one of the people in the hospitals who makes incredibly difficult decisions about when to implement new therapeutics because there's costs associated with all of these things. And even though they may save lives, maybe the money is better spent elsewhere. And it was the first example that, well, not the first perhaps, but it was a formative example that I had of, you know, when, um, it's very difficult to make these decisions and you really do need a, a evidence for these things. And around the same time, I was starting to get more involved in student politics um, and you know, doing consultations on the university-wide policies on um, you know, sexual violence, for example. And you know, I just came closer and closer to saying, okay, you know what, this is something that's very interesting and incredibly important that there are people who bridge this gap of communication and understand both science and also, you know, how does the science factor in to decision making um, and what are the impacts of that. So as I'm getting closer to the end of my PhD, um, I'm trying, I've, I've been engaging more in um, the science policy uh, interface and um, similarly to Amita, the idea of looking at what the impact of these, you know, what the, how science informs policy is really where my passion is. Um, and I am now uh, involved with the um, Toronto Science Policy Network um, is where I do most of that work. Thanks. Thank you, Sophie. Um, yeah, it's excited to have also another PhD student who's kind of going through the same uh, decisions or, or the same thought process that we are all going now, uh, but also to know about um, possible student involvement opportunities that you can do while you're while you're in grad school. So thank you, Sophie. Um, and now without further ado, uh, Madison, do you want to introduce yourself? So hi, everyone. Thanks for having me today. So my name is Madison. I'm joining you from Quebec City, the traditional unceded territory of the Huron Wendat people. Um, I'd like to say that it, it's been a linear path and, and that we, we know where we're going from the get-go, but I really appreciate that a, a few of you have met, mentioned the word pivoting and I feel like that's a good way. It's, there's different points along the line where we, we see an opportunity to pivot or, and you actually take the chance to do it. Sometimes you don't think it's the best idea, but it, 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 it ends up being it in the end. And um, honestly, I had no idea what science policy <laughs> was uh, like way back when actually maybe like go up five, six years ago. I didn't know what science policy was when I um, you mentioned it, Lisa, I, I did a joint honors in math and physics before going into math and physics. I was 
thinking of going into med because no one ever tells you to go into math or physics like who in your family at a Christmas party will tell you like yeah do a physics degree right so um but yeah I just I really liked I like math I like physics so like my experience in stage have influenced me to go towards that and I saw the opportunity to do the joint degree at McGill um, very theoretical degree, very, very <laughs> theoretical. So I ended up um, doing internships during my degree more on the applied side. So within radiation oncology and also optical engineering. And then um, my master's uh, ended up being a master's in medical physics. And um, so it kind of brought me more towards yeah, that, that medical side that, that I was interested in. And um, during my master's, I saw this application opportunity go by for um, le Comité Intersectoriel des étudiants des fonds de recherche du Québec, so the Intersectoral Student Committee. Um, and that was an advisory committee for Quebec's chief scientist, Rémi Carion, who is still the, the current uh, chief scientist. And um, I actually applied for that because it was intersectoral and I, I thought it was, it was a good opportunity. Okay, like I'm in physics, but I'm also in the health, health uh, area. And, so, so I kind of applied to that and then it was kind of an opportunity to see what's going on in these like these funding agencies, how do, how do those things actually work. Um, so I got into that and that's kind of what opened my eyes to what the whole um, policy for science side was and is. And um, it, it's basically a, we were a committee of student advisors from all different kind of uh, sectors who were there to, to advise on issues related to next generation researchers. And I actually got appointed to sit on the board of directors for the Fonds de Recherche Nature et Technologie. And um, so I was the only student there and that was quite the experience because it shakes you up quite a bit. I mean, it's a very, a, a really great training opportunity, but um, there's a few times where people put the, the big questions to you. So you see, so you really learn to, to think in terms of, of all the different factors, like the economic factors, all the, the funding, but also like not just the, um, like we're so used to being in our, our research projects so specific, but then it, it was really an opportunity to, to zoom out and then see, for me, it was a way to, to have a, an impact and look at, well, okay, we have about 30% of funding in Quebec that's going directly into next gen researchers. And then, you're, it was a way to bring that voice to the table and be able to, to work uh, and advise on the different policies that were being put forth. Um, so it was really a great opportunity to actually get involved close to the government as well. So being part, uh, taking part in interim ministerial projects and task forces, such as um, actually one for, for women in STEM. So uh, SAGA, the SAGA initiative, uh, STEM and gender advancement, and also opportunities like uh, eating lunch with the Queen of Belgium. So there was like science diplomacy and all of that, like some really weird things, but it was just like all these opportunities just from applying <laughs> for this committee at one point along the path, right? Um, and, and when I was in that committee, actually, I just want to mention, like I, I was, I got to go to the, the CSPC, so the Canadian Science Policy Conference. And even if that doesn't have anything to do with your research, but it's a great opportunity for, for students to, to just get exposed to the world of science policy. And when I was uh, when I was there, all of a sudden I was like, "This is actually a world. This is actually like a career opportunities." And and you just see what how all the different roles that scientists can play, and, and you can also see how how physicists can fit into that world. So yeah, I just wanted to highlight that too along the path because because that influenced me. And then since then, yeah, I, I now uh, I'm on um, uh, Dr. Mona Niemer's uh, inaugural Youth Council, which is now kind of switching that provincial experience to the federal level and, and another way of kind of zooming out but um and looking at like kind of the macro issues of, of how science can be better integrated into into policy making <laughs> we were involved on the the covid front also and um so so that was kind of like different experiences that um kind of led me to to impact my, my career path because I'm actually trained as a medical physicist. I worked two years as a medical physicist, but then um, I just, from all of those experiences, I wanted something where I felt like I could maybe have a more of an impact, yes, with my, my theoretical, my, my, my technical expertise, but also with all of the, the other skills that I got to develop along the way. So now uh, I'm actually working within uh, Quebec's uh, industrial photonics cluster, but we could talk a bit about that later if it, if it Yeah, thank you very much, Madison, and, and all of you for, for introducing yourself. Um, and it, I'm glad to see that you kind of like went to the flow at the beginning and then opportunities kind of 
come after one after the, I mean, not come out one after the other, but they pop out every now and then, and you never know uh, where they're going to bring you. So, so far, I've, I'm hearing a lot of uh, different like definitions or almost like different goals of uh, of science policy. So some of them seems to be using what we learn from science to inform a uh, policy uh, policymaker. Uh, some seems to be talking to researchers to know where to put funds or what science to fund afterwards. And so in order to kind of like dig a little bit deeper into that, do you want to each of you uh, talk about what your current job is? Uh, maybe talk about an example of project or mandate uh, that you're working on um, or just like give examples of what of what uh, a job in science policy is. Um, we can start with the same order. So uh, Amy, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, I'll keep this super brief because I'm super interested in what everyone else has to say here. Uh, so I think in my role here, I'm actually kind of doing both bits of the cycle, science for policy and policy for science. Uh, so one, one of the, the first things I was tasked with, they saw my degree title when I arrived. I'm like, hey, do you want to help uh, build the d and CAF quantum s and strategy? I'm like, sure. Uh, what's a strategy? So what, what skills am I applying for my PhD? Well, how do you learn, like learning, right? So I know immediately I dove into, you know, what, what makes a good strategy besides, you know, and, and uh, government, uh, this is just a black box that I don't understand. So doing what, by probing it, in what ways can I figure out how the mechanism works around me? If I want to get X done, what do I need to do in order to make it happen swiftly? So I think a lot of that, um, you know, reminds me a bit of B&M, just like the complexity of it all. So that, I, that is, is, is something that I find is a, a nice kind of little bit of an intellectual challenge. Uh, I do a lot of science communication in my role. Of what, what is the relevance of quantum technologies for government and, uh, and for defense? Uh, and I also do that kind of right in the middle between policymakers and scientists. So you know, I didn't realize really until I you know, got into science policy that uh, government does employ a bunch of scientists. So Defense Research and Development Canada, DRDC has you know, defense scientists who have careers in science really, you know, exciting, you know, exciting, stable careers in science and also in, in a lot of other federal departments, you can actually do science there. So I, I, I often, you know, chat with them. So I'm able to speak their language as scientist to scientist, but then I also can turn the other direction and try to communicate, you know, it, what, 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 what the science is for and what it can be about. Uh, so uh, that has been a, uh, a uh, challenge, uh, a, fun, a fun bit there, being the chameleon who can, who can blend into either direction. Also, um, I, well, my writing has really uh, been been a fun intellectual challenge, right? To be able to write briefing notes, to make it so so dense, uh, but incredibly simple without the crutch of acronyms, has been uh, a skill that I've been you know that I've been wanting to to master. And uh, how do you, especially for something like quantum, can you explain why does this matter? Who cares? Uh, and get that get that out there, uh, and to make you know senior decision makers feel confident enough to stand up in front of their peers to talk about quantum. So that has been uh, one of the things that I found enjoyable and uh, and uh, and fun challenges. I also do a little bit of project management. Uh, so evidence informed decision making. Uh, that's one of the things I'm passionate about. So in say the, the main domains of quantum, quantum sensing, communications, and computing. You know what is the state of the art now? Now can we gather good bodies of, of work so then we could make informed decisions about where we should you know go in Canada on some of these areas? So um, that that those are some of the aspects of, of what I do in my job. Thank you, Amy. Uh, so it sounds like a lot of science communication, and it. I, I never thought of science policy as like a venue for science communication. I think outreach or not outreach, but public engagement uh, has always been what I had in mind. Um, but I'll, I'll move on since I think we're, we're starting to run short on time. But Amita, <laughs> um, do you want to tell us uh, what your current jobs or current projects or mandates uh, entail? Yeah, absolutely. So. Right now, I am policy projects director in my nonprofit. There's other people working in different aspects of it. Uh, so I am overseeing a couple different projects and kind of hoping that people also kind of do their own work on there, which they are. And some of those things include kind of documenting a evidence-based policy process. So we have a really clear way of going about it and making sure that we have our ethics straight before we 
actually do certain other policy research. The main project that I'm working on is creating a policy making guide for people who work in tech. So the goal behind this is right now, we mostly have large corporations talking to government about policy. And so it's missing all the people who work in industry. It's missing like themselves as individuals. It's missing people who care about ethics. It's missing researchers. And there's a huge boundary there for people. If you want to interact and influence policy, most people just don't want to go anywhere near it because they don't know anything about it. So we're putting together basically, basically policy making 101. Here's how, if you want to talk to policymakers and why you should, um, how to do it. So that's uh, in combination with a friend of mine at the uh, Montreal AI Ethics Institute. Um, and yeah, it's actually, everything I'm doing is, is a combination of skills that I got in my PhD one way or another. In terms of organizations, you know, it was from extracurriculars like running a woman in physics and astronomy organization and advocacy for inclusion. Um, and then also just research. I'm still doing research. <laughs> so but, you know, that's the same thing. It's, it's different for sure, but it's still research. And then also grant writing. So, you know, we're applying for funding. It's, it's all very, it's all very similar and the skills are amazingly applicable. And I think actually interacting with policy, I love the point about science communication because when I was in doing politics for a little while, I was surprised how well the skill set that I had developed through my PhD was directly applicable in terms of the way I needed to learn to communicate, the way to approach situations, complex problem solving, et cetera. Thank you, Amita. Um, yeah, so it seems like a lot of, I think you're, you're highlighting as well the, the, uh, the importance of doing extracurricular activities and not only research and how much of the skills you've learned from this has also application in what you're doing now. Um, but so Sophie, do you want to go next? Yeah, uh, speaking of extracurriculars, I'm, I'm not going to tell you about what it's like to be a PhD student. There's other resources for that. But I do want to talk about um, just some resources to engage with this type of work while you're still doing your PhD and above and beyond, you know, engaging with the policy at your institution, um, which is also really important um, and might be of interest to you. You can also get involved with things like the um, organizations like the Science Policy Exchange, Evidence for Democracy, or you know the Toronto Science Policy Network, um, which now has kind of broadened out, I'll say, because things are online. So we've got people from all over the country um, coming to things like talks and workshops um, and panels that discuss a broad range of things like, you know, how does how does a policy happen in Canada or in Toronto? Things like that. Just you know, what does that look like? Um, all the way to asking, you know, a panel of experts about policy relating to homelessness and health. Um, it really covers a really broad range of, of um, topics. And some of my favorite are ones that we, we find um, or we invite people who are currently working in Canada, usually um, who are working in po science policy or who are working as a scientist for the government. Um, and they come and talk about their careers. Uh, a lot of those are um, available on the website. So if you're looking for these different types of things, you can, you can find them. But a lot of, um, yeah, absolutely. The TSPN is having their election soon. So if you're interested, you should, you should go look. Um, my role as internal affairs director is, you know, one of the things I love about student orgs is that you kind of can do with things what you want. There's a lot of room for taking on interesting things and being creative with the work that you do. Um, the, the essential stuff is managing volunteers, doing newsletters, things like that. But you also get involved with organizing talks, you know, uh, inviting people to come and speak. We put together a proposal for the federal budget. You participate in science, um, sorry, policy briefing competitions and get some experience writing. Um, it's a really wide range of things. So I, I definitely encourage you to um, engage with one that might be close by uh, or not and um, develop some of the skills that everyone has been talking about where you know, you're really putting your uh, research and communication skills to work um, and seeing what that looks like. Thank you, Sophie. And just, uh, so you talked about uh, election for TSPN to be uh, currently or soon. Um, is this only open to people in Toronto? Um, I believe that the, you have to be right now because of 
because of some policies at the University of Toronto, you have to be a University of Toronto student um, to hold the, an elected position, but, um, and it, the events are open to everyone. There's networking events and trivia and, and lots of different things. So um, that happen virtually, which are open to anyone who wants to come. All right, cool. And I see that there is some uh, information in the chat. So if anyone is interested, you can go there. Um, and, and Madison, do you want to talk about what your current job entails now and some of the projects you're working on? Yeah. Um, so now I'm at Optonique, which in French is Le Pôle d'Excellence en Optique Photonique du Québec. It's actually um, a nonprofit that's funded mainly by, by the Quebec government. And um, so, so it's a cluster. So the, the, the point of Optonique is, is to federate all the actors uh, industrial, academic, government that are related to optics and photonics. And a cluster, a cluster working on it within a cluster wasn't something that was even like on my mind, but then it's something that's a very logical <laughs> choice for me because it's, it's a way to, to apply, to use that technical expertise, but to help, um, to help people, people that don't usually com communicate, don't usually collaborate, help them collaborate better, bring them together, federate them. And that's actually one part of science policy that um, managing, per, for example, expert uh, committees, managing um, or, or organizing together different industrial, government, academic actors, uh, that's a really important part. And a uh, shout out to Science and Policy Exchange that does that at the student level and TSPN as well. Um, and, and it's something that, that I end up doing a lot within my career. For example, I work a lot on uh, talent and outreach initiatives and um, I'm gonna have to <laughs> I'm gonna bring together a lot of people from a lot of different industries and try to attack like talent and workforce development and, and what different um, policies can we put put in place and, and fund for example through the government and how can we do that better um, so so there's that part the the whole like federation managing expert communities but there's also maybe like the science diplomacy part we we collaborate with um, Quebec has De delegation offices all over the world and we, we organize uh, scientific and kind of diplomatic missions and commercial missions across the world uh, to, to help industries initiate uh, in, well industry and academia initiate new collaborations with, with new uh, new partners across the world so that so that's one part that's pretty interesting and um, also working with the Quebec government on their next uh, strategy for research and innovation, so more going into to the policy development side of things. Thank you, Madison. Um, so I'm seeing that we're having about 15 minutes left to, to this, um, so I think I'll just combine the two other questions together um, for, for, our next, uh, for our next discussion. So I, I'm wondering, so for any students who are uh, interested in science policy, what are some of the resources, especially for international students, to engage with science policy in Canada? Um, if you have any thoughts on what the hiring process is or how you prepared yourself for uh, a job in, in science policy or, or to run in politics uh, for, uh, for a, um, an elected position. So starting with, we'll go with the same order again. Uh, Amy? Uh, I'll just quickly talk about the, the MyTech Science Policy Fellowship Program. So that the applications, I think, are, in, are in, start in early each year. So I don't know, approximately January, February to March is when the applications are open. And then the, 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 there's a process that they, the MyTex facilitates to match applicants with different interested de federal departments or, or provincial departments. Uh, so I definitely, to uh, prepare for that application, I really latched on to a lot of the resources on the internet for, for PhDs who are, who are pivoting out of academia. There's a lot of great stuff out there. Uh, and just uh, being able, so I'm able to articulate some of the skills that I, that I had, because unfortunately the culture of physics was not really so kind as to help teach me those words. Like, what did I do? I do research and ITA. Uh, to be learn how to say the to say those skills in you know in actual words uh, was very very helpful for, for this application. So I have a question. So uh, for the my tax fellowship, do organization also have to put in an application to be sort of like a hosting institution as well? Yeah, so my text is kind of the middle person there. So the interested departments do do put in, uh, you know, that they have some positions. So it's the departments themselves that will actually be the one who hire and pay. But the process that that uh, 
of the competition for, for this fellowship program will count for the, the different departments uh, as, as the official process. So MyTex had a special process there, and I think it's slowly cha been changing over the years since I've been there. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, 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 quite, a, quite an interesting experience. With, with training throughout the year, which was actually nice because I moved moved to Ottawa and actually met uh, met a whole bunch of folks in the same boat. So it was like, okay, so we were all learning. We went to these different you know different types of training classes throughout the year. It was a it was a neat year. All right. So uh, if I see any of the emails, I think the deadline for this year is over. But I think usually back in like December or so is when I start seeing uh, um, emails about this. So keep this in mind. Uh, now, Amita, do you want to talk about uh, how, for you, it's a little bit different. I, I guess the hiring process is, in, uh, is more self-motivated. So how did you go about uh, finding the confidence and, and, the, and the will to, to run? And oh, goodness, that's a good question. Um, you know, I really don't know because I was, I'm extremely introverted. I really didn't want to, you know, talk to people. And I'm sure I got those skills from, like, teaching and I, I love like <laughs> talking about TAing and doing research is like skills. It's so true. Being able to explain what you're actually capable of and what your skill set actually entails is it's a process of communication that is not obvious at the beginning. Um, I kind of just dove in and I think that connections are everything and networking is kind of everything in, in all of it. And just it's really important to be aware of what the job you're looking to get is going to be like. So like if you're going to run talk to people who are in those positions or who run for things before to be like, well, what is it, what was it actually like for you to see if it's something you want to do? And then for actually running, you just contact your local like writing association or political organization and whatever party you feel like you want to work with for the moment. I think science is a very nonpartisan thing and I, I am more connected to that than I am to the partisanship. So it's like, it's a vehicle. So just like, what do I think I could be, you know, most impactful for? There for me, yeah, I reached out to a couple different MPs and talked to people. And they they gave me meetings, and I learned a bit. And then I got connected to my local local organizers and started to talk from there. Um, and I learned I learned about the process of what it would be like to run online. And in terms of working, I think for policy nonprofits, um, those jobs do just exist and come up. And I of course picked the other road of doing my own thing. <laughs> But that actually was because of my advisor. So he'd started an organization. So I had the networks of connections and the other people to know how to go for it and how to do that. Um, and again, just looked it up online. Uh, but having, having that advice, having those connections is what gave me the ability to do it because it wasn't just like starting from nothing. It was starting from a place. Um, and I think applying for those jobs, it does, it will involve saying, well, I, I've worked on these various things where I have the experience of both science and policy to some extent, but also being able to say here, here's my skill set, which is always important. And so was there any things that you considered before you kind of decided to dive into uh, politics? Um, is there is there any like uh, things that you that could have prevented you from doing this or, or just like <laughs> Not could have prevented you, but I mean, like, is there any like, counter um, arguments for for not switching out of academia? Yes, there are. I mean, I'm a very willful person, so I just go try things. But um, you know, like, I moved countries during my dissertation and joined a party, two parties actually, and then ran. Um, so that was just that happens to be the way I go about things. But I did, and we talked through it. I think that there are ways if you want to stay in academia, you can also work on policy. You can also work with government. You can also be impactful. And actually, my advisor is a good example of that. He he's founded multiple nonprofits. He does a way too much work, but a lot of it is outside academia working on policy and kind of generally societally impactful things. Um, and I think that that's, that's also up to the opportunities that anybody as an individual has and what they'd like to see their life actually be like in the fine grained sense. All right. Thank you, Amita. So uh, for um, in, in, in interest of time, I think we'll move on to Sophie. Yeah, um, I guess I'm, I'm coming at this from this perspective of 
you know, what am I doing when I'm thinking about these types of roles? And my biggest piece of advice is go to talks like this, <laughs> um, where you get kind of an idea of what people are doing, because it's, at least for me, was really not obvious. I was like, okay, so like science and policy interface, what, but like, what do you, what does that mean? What do people do? Um, and so going to talks and panels or kind of looking at what, um, conversations are going around on like current policy implementation kind of plugging into those spaces um, I think gives you a better picture of the the very wide breadth of types of work that exist um, around science and policy um, and I guess I'm going to echo the thing where that um, Amy and Anita have said which is that it's important to understand what skills you have and a what gaps you might have and how to develop them and you know, as a, a PhD student, there's lots of ways to develop those things um, at your institution and, uh, you know, in Canada in general, but also how to articulate the skills that you do have and how they do translate and how they are useful. Um, and what evidence you have also that you are good at these things. It's not, sometimes not sufficient to say like, I'm a great communicator, but like how, <laughs> about what, and, and what does that mean? Um, and so that would be, yeah, my, my pieces of advice in terms of trying to figure out what you want to do is, get some examples of what people do. And then uh, you can go from there and it helps you build a network as well. Thanks, Sophie. And good luck with, with prepping for, uh, for the next step. I don't know where you are in your, in your PhD um, uh, timeline yet. But so now Madison, how about, how is it for yourself? Uh, how was the hiring process? Did you apply for the positions or did, were, yeah. So actually it's something that um, I got, it got shared with me within my network. So networking is something that is pretty important. So just kind of to go over it, it, it kind of brings together a few things that the other panelists have said. There's the formal processes that you can go through, the, the programs. Um, those programs tend to be and, and become more and more competitive. So I don't want to discourage anyone if they apply and they don't get in. That doesn't mean that your, your road to science policy has hit a dead end. There's so many different ways to, to get involved. And um, I, I would say I liked what Sophie was saying, like what skills do you have? And, and think about what skills do you want to contribute? What, like I, I worked as a medical physicist and at the end of the day, I felt like there was, they needed a medical physicist, but they didn't necessarily need Madison there. So <laughs> what makes up Madison? What do I want to contribute? I, as my person, what are the experiences that I want to bring to the table, the skills I want to bring to the table, and what position do I see myself um, really um, getting the most out of my job and giving the most into my job. Um, so, so those are just things that I, I thought about and I think it's really important to take the time to like it, I like what Sophie was saying, like explore what's out there and then you'll see well what what kind of matches with, with me and what where could I see myself going. Um, Networking is important, like use them and it can be informal links too. It doesn't necessarily have to be this mentor that will tell you where to go. Sometimes it's, ah, I saw this one person and we connected on LinkedIn. Maybe I should reach out to them because they told me about this, this opportunity once or like I know that they're working at this place. Maybe I can get some information. J just reach out. <laughs> like I'll, I'll put my information after on LinkedIn, LinkedIn and uh, feel free to connect. Like I'll be really glad to help out. So it's not necessarily sometimes about timing, but it's just sometimes about reaching out to the like the right person. And um, so, so I just want to say all the physicists here are people that are incredible problem solvers. They tend to be very good innovators and um, there's a lot of different ways that they can translate that into the world of science policy, into science diplomacy, into science outreach. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities and um, I'll, I'd be glad to help anyone who wants to learn more about it. Thank you, Madison. So there's a few minutes left uh, to this hour. So I'll, I'll open the floor to any of uh, the attendees who wants to ask questions. I've seen a few raised hands. So feel free to unmute yourself as, and ask your question to one of our attendees, uh, to one of our panelists, I mean. If not, I see a question in the Q&A that I can ask. Okay, I'll go ahead and, and hear any of you who, who wants to answer first can, can go. So uh, did you ever regret doing a PhD uh, and, and thinking or thinking that it was a waste of time or wasn't helpful at all? 
I think all grad students maybe feel like that at some point. <laughs> and it's like, what am I doing? <laughs> um, but one thing that I went, when I very first started my PhD, I was talking to someone who was like, it was his last day in the office. We shared the office for one day. And uh, something that he said to me has, has resonated and, and applies to this question, which is that, you know, he doesn't know if he could have ended up where he, he had a job that was waiting for him. He was like, maybe I could have, there's another path to this job, but this is the path that I took. And I think that, you know, is it a waste of time to do your PhD? No, if it's what you want to be doing, right? There, there's another way to get where you're going probably, but unless you're planning on being a professor, in which case maybe not, but um, you know, otherwise it, it's, yeah, I, I don't regret it at, at all going in, but it, it may not be the only path to, to where you want to be going, I guess is, is what I'll say. Thanks, Sophie. I personally have a, a few questions uh, regarding, uh, do you work with a lot of scientists every day or, or do you work with a lot of people from different sectors? Um, and do you find what you're doing now fulfilling? I can speak to that a little bit. I work with some scientists, but mostly not. Um, and it's, it's very, very varied in communication and I find what I'm doing incredibly fulfilling. I'll also add about the PhD. I think the thing that I learned when I was in grad school is no matter what you intend to do, you should only be doing it if you want to be doing it because otherwise it's, it just is awful. So <laughs> whatever you want to do, it should always be something you enjoy to some extent, even though it's also awful because of the stress and all those other things. But if, if you love it, that's a good reason to stay. I don't regret it at all. It was, it was great. Thank you, Amita. Um, so we have another question in the chat. Uh, so do you feel connected to the people you work? Uh, so do you feel connected to the people you work with? Uh, I imagine that this job is dependent on other people. Oh, no, I, I imagine this is job dependent. <laughs> So anyone can answer. <laughs> Sorry. I'll say a few words. Um, I so I, I work more in the corporate office of, of DRDC. Uh, so I'm not typically surrounded by a ton of scientists because they're, they're they're in the research centers across the country. Uh, but uh, there I work with a lot of scientists who are now science managers, and that is interesting. And and also with people who aren't former scientists. And uh, I love it because you know I'm I'm a I'm a, a skill zombie or a skill, a skill vampire. Like I, I want, to, I see that I don't have some of those skills and I want to be surrounded by it and try to learn, you know, what I, you know, what I don't have but from my PhD. So I do enjoy that piece a bit there. And back to, I guess I'll we'll slowly touch on the PhD question again. Um, I, I um, actually am, a little, I get still attend a colloquia on quantum. And actually, I enjoy it more than I did when I was in academia because the weight of the world of publisher parish isn't on my shoulders. So I actually can sit there and actually enjoy it. That is something, you know, because otherwise, like, I should be working, I should be in the lab. You know, why isn't that my publication? Why didn't I get that first? No, all that's off. I just can truly appreciate it for what it is. So uh, I do enjoy where I'm situated now. Okay, thank you to Amy for that last comment. That is so true. And right now I go to Optics and Photonics webinars and I, I love it so much. I'm, I'm just sitting there almost eating popcorn just because I don't feel like there's any stress related to it anymore. And I also want to touch on that PhD question. Um, we, a lot of us talked about extracurricular activities. Grad studies was an amazing time to get involved. And there are a lot of opportunities open to students. And if you don't know about them, there's a lot of resources out there, Science and Policy Exchange, TSPN, different organizations are, are there to help you get involved and know about other ways that you can get involved. And, um, and also there's kind of sometimes, like I was on student advisory committees and you sometimes you get gain access to these privileged places because you're a student. And then when I was getting close to the end of my PhD, I was like, I feel like I won't be as important when I'm not a student anymore, which is kind of funny. Um, but uh, it, it's a really great time to develop those different skills, see how, what, what, what did you learn as a physicist? How can you kind of zoom out of what you're working on in the lab and actually apply that into different sectors? 
and working with people that are in social sciences, that are in health, that are in tons of different areas. And, and that's how you learn to, to, well, like to, to innovate, to, to apply your, your skills in, in different situations. And, and that's something that I find very, very fulfilling. So I, I strongly encourage everyone to, to look into different opportunities. Thank you, Madison. It's the first time that I'm hearing someone saying that as a student, we have more privileges than when we're not a student. Um, <laughs> but uh, on, on this certain note, privileges. <laughs> privileges. <laughs> um, but on this note, it's it's now past one, so I don't want to keep you uh, for much longer. I want to thank to thank all the panelists. This was incredibly uh, insightful, and I wish this could go for longer. I have so many question stills. Um, but yeah, again, thanks for all the panelists. Thank you for everyone for coming here. Um, I don't know how we want to end this. Uh, I think if there's any remaining questions, feel free to send them to me. I'll be happy to relay them to uh, our panelists. Um, if there's any resources that have been shared here, we will make sure to either uh, share them with all of the participants and also with, um, with the recording uh, later on. So Without further ado, I'd like to thank all the panelists again. I'd like to give a round of applause if people wants to unmute or, or turn on their video to applaud with me. Um, <laughs> or I don't know if you I don't know if you can. Maybe you can't. <laughs> but either way, thank you a lot for coming. Uh, it was great to have you. Uh, have a great afternoon. And if there is any remaining question also from the panelists, if you want to reach out to me, if there's anything you've forgotten or think is, is important, feel free to, to message me. Thanks so much for having us. It was really a great thank hearing you. from all of you. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you so much for your time. Bye, everyone.